Okay, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us for the Holland Chandler Leadership Series. Holland Chandler is a client-centered law firm providing legal services to individuals, families, businesses, and nonprofits in Charlotte, North Carolina, and throughout the Carolinas. Our award-winning attorneys specialize in business and contract law, employment law, civil litigation, estates, wills, trusts, personal injury, commercial real estate, and nonprofit public charity law. If interested in learning more about how our attorneys can help you solve your real world problems, visit our website at www.hollandchandler.com and schedule a consultation with one of our award-winning attorneys. The law firm of Holland Chandler is proud to sponsor the Leadership Series, a program where Holland Chandler attorney Rocky Cabagnot interviews local and regional leaders in the nonprofit, private, and public sectors to discuss the real world interplay of law, business, and the social dynamics within the context of our continuously changing times. Rocky helps nonprofits stay legally compliant, avoid legal problems, and resolve legal issues as they come up. Nonprofits looking for legal services can choose to bring Rocky on as a management team member through the Fractional General Counsel Program, or can utilize Rocky as an attorney on standby through our firm's affordable legal subscription service. If you wanna learn more, you can follow up with me directly. Don't let your nonprofit go without access to quality legal counsel when it needs it. So everybody, welcome to the Leadership Series and take it away, Rocky. All right, hey everybody, welcome uh, to a happy Wednesday uh, for, to everybody. Uh, you know, it is, it is definitely, uh, first of all, just congratulate everybody for showing up on, on a Wednesday. Uh, and also after many, 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 many months of Zoom, you know, I think that uh, the Zoom burnout is, is possibly real and, and uh, but the very fact that you're here, I know I've talked to Shannon about maybe trying to do a live version of the leadership series and maybe we could have, you know, snacks and, and, and networking opportunities for folks to come maybe in our own office. We have a nice little area there. Um, we may have to upgrade our camera thing. Well, you know what? We're just talking about iPhones. And so maybe we just, just put it on the iPhone or just have two iPhones and maybe we can edit them all together. Um, but anyway, um, let's go ahead and get into the meat of today's show. So, um, so today we're going to be talking about um, addiction, and we're going to be talking about uh, uh, drug prevention, and um, and I got some data for you because you know I like to kind of lead off with with data. But uh, so we've got um, new data released from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention shows just in 2020, obviously the year of COVID, opioids killed about the same number of Americans as who died in the Vietnam and Korean Wars combined. Um, and um, as a, a Southlight CEO, that's a nonprofit uh, CEO, Adam Hartzell said, is we've got a perfect storm of the opioid addiction crisis in our community as well as the COVID crisis. And as you can tell with the Delta variant, uh, you know, as I jokingly say, I can't believe they renewed COVID for a second season. That's just how that feels, you know. Um, but you know, it, it says here that um, it shows that opioids killed 93,000 Americans in 2020. So that's aside from COVID. Obviously, we know the data COVID was bad, but uh, opioids, you know, still taking out as many Americans as both these wars in Korea and in Vietnam. Um, it says here that deaths rose close to 30 percent nationwide, which is the highest number ever recorded. And um, in North Carolina, opioid deaths in 2020 were up nearly 35%. Um, so uh, it does signal that uh, we are seeing an ongoing problem with opioid addiction. And again, there are obviously other addictions out there, but you know, it seems that this particular um, plight um, is is quite um, you know is quite quite a problem. And so um, joining us today is. Uh, Ricardo Torres from the Center for Prevention Services. And so Center for Prevention Services is a, a, a local regional nonprofit 501c3 public charity that is uh, dedicated to um, obviously what its name is, uh, prevention, you know, um, preventing um, suicide, preventing drug abuse, um, and all of the all of that above. And so um, please just join me in, in welcoming um, Ricardo to our show. I wish 
we need to we need to clap thing. We need the thing to kind of go clap, 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 you know. Uh, <laughs> Thank uh, you. To... <laughs> so to Ricardo, before we jump into that very heavy, heavy topic uh, of, you know, of drug abuse and, and COVID and all of those things, um, I, I like to kind of take a, a question from my friend Pat McDowell, who has a great podcast on nonprofit uh, leadership um, called The Path to Your Nonprofit Leadership. But he always asks, um, please tell me what is your path to nonprofit leadership? So before we get into heavy, heavy topics, maybe you could tell us a little bit about you, Ricardo, and your path to where you are in the nonprofits. Well, that's a good question. Thank you, uh, both Rocky and Shannon, for the opportunity to, to be with you all today. Uh, my walk in the prevention and health and human service world began back in early 2001, possibly. Um, mm. Started working in with, I'm trying to summarize this as fast as I can, because like I said, I can talk a lot. Shannon knows this. Uh, I started out working at the Salvation Army Women's Shelter, where I met Shannon, but in my area of there was working with the homeless population and trying to get them resources to get uh, eventually out of the homeless shelter. So then, many uh, after three years jumping into uh, center, uh, sorry, the chemical dependency center, which is known as Anuvia Prevention and Recovery, did prevention for eight years, working in high school, middle, middles, college, and uh, high schools, working on working with parents and youth on the prevention side. Let's get kids before they start using, giving them the facts so that they could do something more productive than doing the stuff that harms their future. Um, did that for eight years, loved it, still loved it, but, you know, needed to grow and try something new, jumped over to the police department, worked with the Gang of One program for about three years until it dissolved, then went back to school, um, mm -hmm. and then eventually worked, went back into the field again, and uh, insurance, uh, Medicaid, uh, helping the Latino population and folks with intellectual development disabilities and drug use and treatment. And then now I am the Latino program manager for the Center for Prevention Services. So in a nutshell, that is my 20 years of scope of dedication to the Charlotte community, um, especially Latinos. I mean, the good thing about being bilingual is I could serve anybody who speaks either tongue. And um, I'm not bragging, I'm just saying, not just uh -huh. Latino. Anybody who speaks English and Spanish, I have the, the, the opportunity to reach out educate and give them resources so anyway that's me <laughs> oh. well, well thanks um thanks so obviously we've learned a little bit about ricardo but um for those of you who aren't super familiar with the center for prevention services could you tell everybody a little bit about the center for cps sure sure uh well i'm at They've been around for 50 years, since 1971. Uh, basically, they work, started working in primary mission and substance abuse prevention in Mecklenburg County only at the time. Mm -hmm. um, then eventually, they were known as the Drug Education Center. Uh, and then 1998, changed their name to um, Substance Abuse Prevention Services. And then in 2011, changed their name again to Center for Prevention Services. But they're a nonprofit organization that is uh, basically promotes uh, healthy living and prevention addic addictions through um, integrated approaches to health. We now cover not just Mecklenburg, we're in Rowan, Stanley, Union, and Davidson, including Mecklenburg. Okay. I, I'm stationed in Mecklenburg, that's my, my area, and I believe that CPS does so many things we'll get into in a little bit if anybody has any additional questions, but um, we've been around 50 mm -hmm. years. So I haven't been there in the whole 50 years, but within mm -hmm. the 20 years in the field, I've heard of Center for Prevention mm -hmm. Services and all the great things they did. Little did I know that I would be back in the area of prevention, but anyway, yes. <laughs> so, so we got you, we got Center for Prevention Services. Tell mm -hmm. us about how you connected and what you're doing with Center for Prevention Services. Well, um, I, when I was, when, without going into details that deter from, you know, what you really need right now is, uh, when I was in school for the second time mm -hmm. around, I was still work, working closely with, uh, as a volunteer mm -hmm. in the uh, Alianza Latino Drug Free Coalition as their vice chair and chair for about four years. And what we did, I didn't even know that existed, but the the Drug Free Coalition in English already existed, but they they created one in Spanish for the Latino population. 
Mm-hmm. I was the volunteer at the time. I fell in love with the concept and all the things we did. We won a national award. We'd done a lot of things where a lot of people didn't really get mm-hmm. the recognition because nine times out of 10, you hear more negative stuff in the media than you do about, about the, the great things we do and anything that happens. Mm-hmm. So anyway, um, when being in that area, they approached me and said, hey, Ricardo, would you like to be a Latino program manager? You did great as the chair. We would love for you to continue in their, in their efforts with the grants to apply for more and then possibly do more work. And I said, sure. So March of 2021, that's all she wrote. Now I'm here and um, getting my feet wet now, ready to to conquer and work closely with people in the community who want to make a change. So so the name of your particular program that you're overseeing, it's part of CPS and it's called Alianza. Correct. And so um, for those of us, so kind of, Take us through the day, like sort of what is Alianza about and, and who are you working with? And tell us a little bit about Alianza. Okay. Well, uh, Alianza, I can tell you, has been around. Uh, its humble beginning started back in 2014, where mm-hmm. a group of people in the community got together and said, you know what, there's something wrong that's not being addressed. Uh, the Latino kids within Charlotte Mecklenburg schools, there, there's more overdoses and there's areas where kids are getting involved in drugs and there's not a lot of services for that. Hmm. So um, they came together with a plan, applied for the very first grant with the Drug Free Communities Grant, which is from SAMHSA, now it's CDC. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we've had it for six years. And we have, we've actually, sorry, five years. We've applied for years six through 10. We get it for the next five. We find out soon if that's the case. And we'll continue our efforts in mm-hmm. trying to stop, like I said, underage drinking, which is a big thing within Latino festivals. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, working closely with the different people, uh, the atrium, the, the vaunts, the, the business community, mm-hmm. to make sure that we could make sure that a lot of the things that we're trying to pull off work so that mm-hmm. there's visibility, there's, there's messaging around it, things of that nature, to make sure that mm-hmm. we can bring that change to Mecklenburg County. So... You mentioned like uh, like alcohol abuse is is large. So what would be like if you were to say, because um, it sounds like you're focusing. On, I mean, we can talk obviously about youth overall, but obviously Alianza is focusing on Latino youth and, and, and family. But what are the I guess? Um, cause I know I started a show about opioids, so maybe uh, one is like is opio are, are opioids a huge issue or a huge problem for Latino youths and families? And then two, um, what are the other ones such as like, like I guess, narcotics and, and, and alcohol and how, are, how do they kind of factor in? Okay, well, that's a good question. Um, for the past 30 years, uh, add more history and dates, sorry. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. We're here to educate. Uh, yeah, we, we've been doing a youth drug survey at, uh, we, we, we administer it through CMS and mm-hmm. The data that is given there is is just so helpful in not mm-hmm. just us, any providers, the health department, and so forth, applying for other grants federally and state to to bring to bring things to the community. So what we find within the 2020 um, YDF Youth Drug Survey is that Latinos, I mean, across the board, it just says everything, not just Latinos, but since my department specifically works for the Latino population to to Uh decrease their numbers, is alcohol is the number one drug used by a lot of Spanish-speaking people. But of course, if you look about it all across the board with all the races, it's across the board, not just Latino issue. Uh Um, Alcohol, number one. Two, marijuana. Now that we have these bills coming up to make uh, medical marijuana legal and not to mention eventually recreational, those are issues that a lot of people don't see about early onset and the developmental issues that happen with people who start using drugs at a young age. Then you start looking into uh, opioids uh, are being used by high school seniors at a very high rate. So mm. it, it's, it's something that we try to like, our main drugs of focus, I already mentioned alcohol, already mentioned marijuana, Vaping mm-hmm. is, uh, people are vaping THC, which is the main ingredient in marijuana, mm-hmm. and not to mention, you know, um, opioids. So mm-hmm. drugs are being consumed. It's just you're not hearing much about it because it's always like a, a taboo topic, especially in the Latino population where you're, you don't want to put your family business out there that you're, yeah. that you're smoking up or you're mm-hmm. getting drunk on the weekends 
for every soccer game or quinceanera or any festival that you go to. It's like, mm -hmm. it's almost like the, 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 I tell the joke, mm -hmm. you know, Cinco de Mayo is not an actual festival to celebrate for all in Mexico. That's just another reason why a lot of Anglos like to get drunk. <laughs> That's promotional. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, you know what I mean? No, yeah, you can go into any like college bar on uh, Cinco de Mayo. I mean, it's, it, not a lot of Mexican history being taught, you know. <laughs> exactly. And there's a lot more to it than people don't realize. Right. So, yeah, yeah. it's just uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of ignorance out there, but it's just, mm -hmm. I don't know. So those drugs are the ones that we that are yeah, targeted. So yeah. Yeah. So it does seem that opioid. I mean, I know that definitely whenever you think of opioids in particular, and again, this show isn't all about opioid, but it definitely, I think, in policy and in discussions, it seems that like sort of hog the spotlight now of, of all the various addictions, particularly when we're talking about about youth. You know, I mean, we've got attorney generals who are suing, you know, like the Sackler family, and and with good reason, you know. Um, you know, and, and doctors, because, you know, doctors were just like prescribing this thing like it might as well have just been like a bakery or you want a cookie here, have some blue pills, you know, I mean, it was, right. and, and um, so has there been, a, I mean, I know that definitely among, among youth overall, and particularly, you know, you know, they always say, you know, like, you know, places like uh, rural North Carolina and, and, and things of that nature. Um, but uh, is, is, is it on the rise as well with, with Latino youth as well, the opioids? Yes. Um, one of the things that I could tell you is the pandemic is still currently going on. So the numbers of how the rates are going up will be measured in this year's survey that we will conduct mm -hmm. at CMS in the fall of uh, probably, I'm not sure if it'll be this year, might be 2022, but we're going to see a lot mm -hmm. more of what the CDC has already been predicting in other states because mm -hmm. since people are cooped up there are a lot of parents, I mean, there's a lot of things people use to cope with the loss of someone who's died from COVID or mm -hmm. being uh, being affected, ment their mental health being affected. They think that, let, let me mm -hmm. self-medicate, alcohol yeah. and maybe other pills. Before you know it, those rates have not totally been calculated yet, but mm -hmm. we should anticipate that those numbers are going to go up. Not because I said so, because the reality is that a lot of people who are not coping with things and uh, co coping with their emotion and their mental health and, and things of that nature are going to those substances. And it's really mm -hmm. easy to find because there's not a lot of education on, hey, mm -hmm. these pills do this. They could kill you or you become addicted. Mm -hmm. They don't really tell people that information. Mm -hmm. My parents don't know. So you will see that rise. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's a prediction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not by me. Look at the CDC rec the numbers already. I mean, CDC yeah. is pretty knowledgeable. Yeah, I yeah, I think that it's one of the things. I mean, you know, other youth is not necessarily like. Uh, um, I think it's just you know, there's yeah. I think that uh, yeah, I, I see it rising a lot. Well, tell me a little bit about. So obviously, you know, we've got uh, alcoholism, we've got uh, drug abuse, and we also would you know, in in, in that you know from you know, your quote unquote softer drugs like marijuana all the way up to like heroin, fentanyl, um, mm -hmm. cocaine, crack or something. Um, so you've got, so Alianza and the Center for Prevention Services, you know, you've got particularly, I guess, from from the communities that you're working with, you know, you've, you, like, I think I'm looking here at the web page here and it does say, it says here, in most Latin American countries, the legal drinking age is 18, uh, but the legal drinking age is not heavily enforced. So people begin drinking much earlier than that. And and so it's not necessarily, at least with alcoholism, it's not necessarily a cultural taboo to be, you know, like a preteen or someone with a, here, here, have Modelo, you know, <laughs> drink a beer, you know, and and, and 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 such. What are the approaches that, that Alianza and you are, are using and, 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 and to kind of address that? Because, again, it's sort of like, you know, there's always that sort of a feeling like, oh, what's the harm, you know? Uh, you know, our mm -hmm. son, you know, he, he we, 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 he's been working with us, you know, we're all drinking a beer after working outside. Why can't we give, you know, why can't we give, uh, you know, our son a, a beer? I mean, he's, he's going to start high school, but, you know, he, he needs to learn like the rest of us. Tell us, how, how do you kind of, because there's that sort of, sort of like, what's the harm? I'm not even saying it's necessarily endemic to the culture, but there's mm -hmm. just a com common idea like, oh, yeah. come on, what's the harm in just one, even give them the small, you know, like, I know, because, you know, like there's the, the, the Moto Lito or something, the small one, right? Yeah, just 
he's small, give him a small beer, you know? I mean, what, like, what's the harm in it? How do, you, how do you kind of, like, push back or at least try to at least educate around it, if not necessarily push back on that kind of trope of sorts? Well, we, we try to give people facts. And we okay. that just say no stuff, you know, that doesn't work. That was in the Reagan era. Yeah. Um, that drug they war is still being lost <laughs> today. You know, I'm not going to go into details in history, yeah. but realistically, yeah. I mean, what I've learned work, talking to parents and the youth that we work with, we have a youth, uh, Alianza Youth Council, and okay. we get buy-in from what like, what the youth are telling us. These kids were, were might have been born here, they might have been born abroad, but they, they have Latino families. They, they were born mm -hmm. here as well. And they say, Ricardo, uh, this is, uh, sorry, Mr. Torres, this is what we see. You know, and I'm not the ones working with the youth individually. It's it's my staff. But when I get a chance to go out there, they 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 talk about the normalization that a lot of the parents tell them, like, "Hey, a sip of ink is not going to harm you." So we go into educating the parents through different like Zooms. We have to, we had to do mm -hmm. everything through Zoom the past year and a half. We're still kind of doing it too because of the yeah. brand. So we'll do like information sessions about how alcohol affects the brain in their development. Mm -hmm. So it's not coming off from a, a standpoint of stigmatizing and blaming the parent because it's really easy mm -hmm. to say, you know, uh, parents are dumb. No, that's not the way to go about doing it. I don't like no one telling me I'm dumb. I know that I'm not perfect. However, let's see how we can start a conversation with your kids at a younger age and have it all the way up. So mm -hmm. hold on a second. Sorry, kids are making a lot of noise already. You know what? That is all too relatable. All too relatable. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The life of Zoom, but you know, yeah. just in in conversation, mm -hmm. showing parents the the danger so they can make informed decisions, making sure they lock mm -hmm. up their alcohol because I could. Mm -hmm. It's easily. It's really easy to say lock up your medications, lock up your right. alcohol, and having those conversations with their kids so they know why they shouldn't consume these things, and also doing something about it which is also, it's really easy to come in someone's home and mm -hmm. I'm not preaching, I'm not walking the walk either. I came to my house one day when I, after I went to a training and realized all my medications are opened up in the cabinets right there in the, in the, kitchen, in the kitchen area. And so is my liquor in a, in a, within an area. Does that mean, you know, I, I can't drink? No, that means I need to be more safe in thinking that, hey, if I don't think mm -hmm. my kids are ever going to try it, then I'm, I'm actually mm -hmm. not doing due diligence in the sense of, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not really yeah. walking the walk. I have to be able to be a good example. And I have, I've locked up my yeah. alcohol to make sure that only my wife and I have access. And if it hasn't been broken into, I know yeah. how to say, oh, someone's been in here. We yeah. know, you know what I mean? Having those subtle yeah. conversations. And, and what we're doing now is we're yeah. using a lot of social media marketing. We're using a lot yeah. of PSAs created by the youth, TikTok, mm -hmm. all these different avenues to make messages in English and Spanish mm -hmm. to make it more aware, you know? Uh, number one, it, not doing nothing about it and blaming people is not the way to do it. So mm -hmm. these avenues that we're doing with the education sessions for the parents is one. Teaching them new techniques is another, different tool sets, things like that. And, you know, give them the latest numbers on statistics on what's going on, that what the youths have, the youths, sorry, sound like the, my cousin Vinny, the youths. Yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> 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 right. The youths, that's good. The youth are telling yeah. that's, us. That's why I went to law school. I saw that movie. I was like, you know, I'm going to be Vincent uh, Gambini. That's who I'm going to be when I grow up, right? <laughs> Two youths. <laughs> okay. Sorry, y'all. That's that was good. It's good to have a sense of humor. I tell you, in any yeah. world, any work you do. Yeah, there's no sense of humor on this show. That was that was a, that was a mistake. <laughs> yeah, hey, it's not scripted. I tell you, people, this is live on the air. <laughs> um, but no, just like I said, having com conversations, several conversations. It's like, how many times do you have to talk about sex with your kids? Several times. Mm -hmm. Those taboo topics need to stop being taboos and have mm -hmm. information given at each time, a little different, not overwhelming them and just completely giving them all the information. That's not the way mm -hmm. to do it. So just providing those details, those information to the parents and mm -hmm. utilizing every avenue possible of communication from radio. We started back in the day doing radio and TV. Uh, radio, sorry, radio and newspapers. Newspapers don't exist much anymore. Everything's digital. 
So now you got social media. Now you have all these things that we use to, to bring messages to people. Now we're using social media and the things I told you about. So I'm not saying it's an easy walk and we don't know how many people we've affected, but mm -hmm. we've even used billboard campaigns to put messages out there. There's one on Independence mm -hmm. Boulevard right now. There's one on South Boulevard and our target zip codes. Mm -hmm. So it's just, we're looking at that and we'll see how many people have viewed it. But mm -hmm. the ultimate result will be in that youth drug survey that we do to see mm -hmm. if there's been an impact through mm -hmm. the education that's been provided through all those avenues. So, so I know like when I'm looking at the, the Center for Prevention Services, I know that there is a, a, you know, a, a discussion of evidence based programming, right? Research based. I mean, what I guess really if, you know, we're, we're hearing about all these ways to kind of deal with addiction and, and substance abuse and, and things what what works because i know like i think like when i think about the issue i think well if i were here and i'm gonna tell i'd be like listen you know if, if you, you should do this that or the other but obviously you know it's like uh evidence and, and, and research and, and such uh you know ha, you know people have been studying substance abuse for a long time i would imagine right i mean obviously your organization has been around for 50 years and that made me kind of shake my head because you said it's been around for 50 years. And I thought, man, I bet you that thing's been around since 1940. And then he said 1971. I'm like, oh, man, I was born like a couple of years. Ago. Oh, my I'm, I'm uh, you know, I started freaking out a little bit. Like, that's not cool. <laughs> I mean, you know, because like for the longest time I hear 50 years, I'm like, oh, it was started back when Dwight Eisenhower was president or something like that. And no, no, no. Yeah. It has yeah, a seven on it. It's not the, it's not a four or a five <laughs> you know, connected to that. Um, but, yeah, what I mean. So what, I guess, like, if I'm in the audience and I'm thinking, like, like I'm hearing about this, but what does work? Because maybe we, these are some takeaways that we can go to our organizations and what kind of, like, what does the evidence and the research show about what are these interventions that either organizations or individuals or churches or communities or governments, what are the interventions that actually work? Um, and Because and, and, I think that would be a great takeaway for us. Well, I think... Things have to evolve. Like evidence-based okay. programs have always existed, and not all school systems adapt them all. Sometimes mm -hmm. I remember the times when I started in prevention, we would go to the schools in the PE classrooms and teach this for one hour uh, every other week, and it was a series of maybe eight to ten sessions based on what the curriculum was created for. And these evidence-based programs have been studied enough to been proven that they work. So the problem is maybe if it was designed in Ohio, it mm -hmm. might not work in North Carolina because the population is sure, sure, sure. like a geographic or cultural component to it. Exactly. That's what the main thing was missing nine times out of 10. So with me as a professional presenter, I would have to look at the content and look at how mm -hmm. I would go teach it in an sure. ESL classroom. It's not a one size fits all thing. Right? No, it's not. Okay. And that's the unfortunate part. But over time, now mm -hmm. there are evidence-based programs that are designed for the different populations of folks that that were neglected. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, we tend to use those, um, like for example, in Mecklenburg County, there's one called Families Forward, but in Spanish it's Familia Adelante. Okay. And it was designed by someone in Los Angeles, California, who's a, a psychologist, working mm -hmm. closely to see what are the main issues that kids tend to have when they're acculturating to the culture. And right. You know, what are the problems? P problems with acculturation stress, uh, issues with sex, HIV and AIDS. I mean, that's a big taboo within the, even the Latino community. People don't want to talk mm -hmm. about it, you know. Of course, drugs, gangs, and anything else that have to do with things of lifestyle mm -hmm. that, that changes people in a way that if you didn't have that information, it creates a lot of problems in the home. So mm -hmm. it's designed to work with the parents, but it's also designed to work with youth. So mm -hmm. that component of having two separate groups teaching similar content to the level of education of the parents mm -hmm. is very beneficial. They'll walk away with, oh, man, I could try this this time because apparently what I'm doing is not working. Mm -hmm. And it's like I said, it's like you give, you're giving somebody tools, a free toolbox. And if mm -hmm. they utilize it, great. If they don't, then mm -hmm. you at least try it. And hopefully they'll go back to it and say, oh, I remember what Mr. Torres or Betty mm -hmm. Sue, whoever taught me was trying to teach me about how to talk to my kid about communication mm -hmm. and 
effective ways of bringing and talking about sex or mm -hmm. talking about drug use. You know, what, right. what you know, I want, you know, mm -hmm. parents need to be specific. If the kids, if they want their kids to be doctors and successful mm -hmm. or whatever, lawyers or so forth, how do they do that? Mm -hmm. By teaching them to live, you know, like I said, mm -hmm. drug free as right. long as they can so that mm -hmm. they could be developed normally and mm -hmm. hopefully God willing or whatever, reach their goals yeah. in life. Yeah, you, I, think you're, I yeah. think you hit on something there because I think you mentioned, I think I heard a term and maybe you can define a little better, acculturation stress. Because mm -hmm. it sounds like, you know, um, because I, I'm the child of immigrants myself, you know, and I, you know, it's like I, you know, like, why well, can't you speak English as well as the other people and all those other sort of things. But I, and I guess it means like for various people, when you say the term acculturate, I mean, I'm thinking what I think, but maybe you're, you want, I would like to hear how you define that particular term. Well, the acculturation stress has to do with the, the, th the, the way the, the behaviors and customs that you bring uh that when you're coming into a different area right it doesn't adapt well to what how your norms we used to be from the country mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you come from so you're stressed out and trying to mm -hmm. understand why whatever you're doing had had done before is not working currently in their new environment mm -hmm. so there it transfers to the parent the kid right you know, and vice versa because like i said they, they, it's almost like shifting them from one environment to another Mm -hmm. And of course, probably if you look it up on the dictionary or Wikipedia, it'd probably much be much different. But that's the way mm -hmm. I see it. Right. And it is stressful when you don't know what the heck to do when yeah. whatever worked before worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, because I mentioned, I heard you say that you know, because I know that it's definitely focused on youth, but I've heard you say speaking to parents because I think there is kind of maybe maybe the gap or the the trend because. You know, if you are a first generation, definitely a second generation American, I mean, well, probably by the time you kind of acculturated with everything, but definitely, you know, you've got sort of the old world sort of like, you know, aspect of things. And then, of course, you're here in whatever part of America, obviously various mores, if you're in the rural North Carolina, a little different than urban Charlotte, you know, and, and such. But um, I'd be interested in that, like, because I guess, like, for instance, um, you know, you know, is uh, you're talking about certain taboos. And again, you know, with a, with a certain, you know, again, I don't want to paint, you know, Latin American culture with a huge brush, but we know, like say Roman Catholic church has a long history uh, in, in Latin America. And anyone who's halfway familiar with the Roman Catholic church knows that there are a lot of taboo things about being a Catholic girl, you know? And so when you're talking about tell, trying to instruct a, parent you know particularly an immigrant parent to talk about sex with their children even though or, or or something i mean how do you kind of navigate that wall you know mm -hmm. of sorts um to be able to at least because because the the effect is real right i mean you yeah. know that, that that unwanted pregnancy um drug abuse uh, alcohol abuse these things but again it's either we're definitely not going to talk about it or on one end. And then the other one is like, oh, what's the harm? You know, there's like, I don't see no harm in giving them, you know, I mean, I guess it's like when you're having these conversations, I'd love to hear kind of like, and maybe you can share like, what are the techniques or how, where do you find your ways to kind of, kind of um, get your advocacy in and kind of get them going? You know, I didn't think about that. You know, that's a good point, Ricardo, you know, where, you know, um, yeah, I didn't really think about it that way. I mean, what, what, how do you get there? How do you get to that point where you get them nodding their head? with you well establishing trust is one of the big things in any culture it's like you don't come in like saying yes i know everything because i have a phd i mean those people kind of make me laugh because at the end of the day they probably know their stuff but they're coming off like in the wrong way you got to come off right, right. where you're concerned but you're really willing to listen your body language speaks volumes to you actually giving a crap sorry for saying mm -hmm. like that about what's yeah. going on with the person you know you're talking with the parent you're concerned for their kid and their concern, your concern for the kid will say, oh, okay, this person must really care about my son or daughter. So they then will little by little give them bits and pieces and you're starting to chip away a little bit of that wall that mm -hmm. has been established where, you know, you've been taught something, there's nothing you could teach me because I, I came out all right. My parents used to whip me all the time when it comes to their <laughs> corporal punishment, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the flip flop or the belt. Mm -hmm. You know, that was one topic anyway that was very it's kind of hard you have to I, know, I, I, 
I grew up with the belt and the and the Zapata, the shoe. Yeah, no, I, I know all about that. <laughs> I know all about that. There's a, there's I'm trying to that, but I know all about that. <laughs> Yeah, but corporal punishment to me is I don't know it as corporal punishment. I know it as discipline. You know what I mean? And and, and mm -hmm. to me, what we got to do is not come off as, uh, like I said, come off in a, in a way, that, in a tone that's not blaming or demeaning. Mm -hmm. So once you start talking to people in, in terms, you know, hey, what is it that you do um, when you discipline your kid? Is it effective? Ask that question and have them actually think about that question. And, you know, have you thought of this? And then when they listen to other parents do, I mean, the dynamics of having other people in a group is pretty cool because you get to see what one mom or one dad is doing and what the other one is, hasn't tried yet, but they'll learn it to listen from, to them, not this, this guy right here. And before you know it, by relating that message, they'll mm -hmm. learn from them. So you, in other words, you're teaching one and then they will ship it to the other. Sorry, my cat's on my lap. No, it's awesome. Hello, everybody. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Vicky, get down. I'm, I'm, I'm working here. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> it, 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 it takes a... The cat needs to sign a waiver, by the way. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> you're, not, you're famous now. Um, <laughs> no, it, it's, it's basically just establishing that rapport talking to people in a way, giving them bits of information. And not to mention, you talk about it a little bit more, occult, like for the acculturation stress part, for uh -huh. example. You, uh -huh. it's, not, it's not just a one session deal and you just go on and forget about it. It's right, right. touched upon a little bit each time, each session. So you're recapping, but at the same time, the great thing about uh -huh. doing evidence-based programs now is when you teach uh -huh. the parent, you're teaching the kids uh -huh. similar things. So when they go uh -huh. home that, that, week, that week that they're together, they will discuss mm -hmm. it at the dinner table or whenever they're together. Mm -hmm. And then when they come back, they'll talk about, hey, what was the outcome of your conversation with your kid about mm -hmm. discipline or about acculturation stress gotcha, or about gotcha. sex or whatever, mm -hmm. or dating, you know, whatever the, the, when it comes to the, so the topics of th that is truly affecting that family mm -hmm. and having those conversations they've never had before open mm -hmm. the door to better communication and better understanding. So the kid can tell the parents, mom and dad, listen, I don't appreciate when you do this, this, and this, and mm -hmm. this doesn't work. I mean, this is the best way to uh, to have you understand what I'm, where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, in a way it's therapy, but I'm not a therapist. Mm -hmm. I'm providing right. the tools, the parents go home mm -hmm. and hopefully they do it. And when they come back, they're, they're seeing mm -hmm. the change. And mm -hmm. by the end of the sessions, they're like, Mr. Torres, does this program really have only eight weeks? Can we continue? They want to continue oh, wow. a support group. And I'm like, oh, you can, but I can't be here. <laughs> You're going to have to, <laughs> you know what I mean, continue without me. Because you know? it sounds like maybe parents are actually, because, you know, I think at, at one level, it's like um, maybe there would be resistance at first. Like, you're going to tell me how to parent. But it sounds like after going through this, they're almost like, can we continue this process? Because I'm learning a lot of a lot of new things here um, and, and such. Um do you ever teach, I, I only ask this because I just know like every once in a while, like I know that at, at my kid's school, they had this sort of like, I don't know, and they did it outside because of COVID, but how to tell if your kid is using drugs by looking at their bedroom or, or, or something like that. Um, I mean, I guess my question is, do you guys follow that kind of thing? Because I, I always find that kind of interesting, like to teach your parent, teach parents how to, I don't know, they almost be like, feds or something i figured out there's been you know um uh if they're hiding drugs in the room or something like that i mean it, 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 do you guys do that kind of thing or is it sort of or you at least have those kind of conversations uh, it could lead there it could lead there uh -huh. it's just a matter of it depends on whatever you're teaching you know what i mean uh -huh. i'm not sure you give me a specific topic but it's like you know we're when in the moment we're talking with them, they they might share, they might not, or they they will tell us a little bit of what what is what has transpired. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I'm answering your question. <laughs> no, I mean, well, I mean, no. I think it's just I was just wondering. It's more of a curiosity uh, mm -hmm. aspect because you know, I mean, that's more of my anecdotal thing. Like I just noticed that at least twice during the school year. They had, well, if you, you have a parents and then they set up a mock bedroom. I don't know. I didn't go. I was just like, you know, I just, uh, but uh, I didn't know if that was a technique. If that's, if, I don't even know if that's 100% like research based or whatever. It's just sort of, 
And I thought it was just an interesting exercise that was kind of performed. Um, and then it was definitely related to like, obviously prevention of, you know, substance abuse. We do role time. plays. Like how uh -huh. would you relay this information to your kid in that way? Because it's okay. easy for you to throw out all the information, but mm -hmm. then there's, you're forgetting about the visual learners and the people who learn hand, hands on. So whenever okay. you teach a content, you give them a scenario and act, maybe ask volunteer to see who would do it. Uh -huh. And there, they honestly say, oh, thank you so much for allowing that example yeah. because I get to practice it and then take it home, not just uh -huh. wing it when I, when I go home and completely forget what I'm supposed to ask or say, uh -huh. you know? So that's yeah. the great thing about prevention. Yeah. You don't always yeah. have to follow a certain uh -huh. standard or rule because it's, it's almost like that's the problem. These uh -huh. programs are designed to work the way they are, but you kind of have uh -huh. to put your own, um, your style into it and to ask yeah. them what works and you know what i mean i don't know yeah. i think that it's a it's a it's a developing thing it's not something yeah that well you know because well, you know when i think about when i was growing up you know we had well, i actually got asked them before they had dare but there was obviously the, all of the communication was from the experts to the child right or to the student you know they kind of bypassed parents my parents never had to go or were never really invited to speak to some sort of expert. They got all of us kids into some auditorium, made us do some silly dance and wear a shirt that says, I'm not going to use drugs. And that was pretty much, you know, that mm -hmm. was pretty much it. It sounds like right. this particular from the takeaway I'm hearing from you, Ricardo, is number one, when you're doing this type of work, come at it at a certain sense of humility and right. a certain sense of uh, down to earth that you are not some PhD credentialed expert. You're going to do what I say because you're a dumb pig or whatever, you know, if you can't, I follow these instructions that you try to get on the level of your audience. And then two, it sounds like this approach that you is, is focused on the parent and then the parent will do it to the child versus, cause I, I haven't heard you say, we round up a whole bunch of Latino kids. We stick them in a room and we just go, don't do drugs. You know, it sounds like this is a different sort of uh, 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 approach. Right, it is because that approach that you're just mentioning it is the Dare program back in 19 whenever I started I it like it many years ago. <laughs> but yeah. and then it's it's proven on us honestly that program did not work, believe it or not. But for me, I tell people this: that was the very first time ever anybody talked to me about drugs. Okay. When that Dare so officer came to my room with yeah. uh, he didn't have a little stuffed animal lion or whatever, but it was just a culture <laughs> oh, like a marionette. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. You know, and he didn't say, hey, look, these are all the pills, y'all. I mean, he didn't really go into <laughs> massive detail of what, what was what. He, uh -huh. uh, but that left a lasting impression because this person who was a, a person of authority, a cop, who really uh -huh. cared. And he was very caring in the way that he delivered the message. But that was what impacted me. But does that stay around? And is that enough of what a kid needs to hear? No, he needs to hear it said differently with, with compassion, with understanding. Uh, and not to mention, have those have your kids being able to come talk to you about it is it, mm -hmm. great without jumping straight on the you know jumping on them and, and lecturing them because mm -hmm. that that approach of the just say no does not work. It's proven it yeah. does not work. So the prevention aspect of giving people information, giving them the resources of how to refuse, but also how to learn how to live a healthier life. Parents also have to live that example as well. Mm -hmm. I might drink every now and then, but I, of course I don't drink and drive because I know that there's laws out there and I don't want to have to hire Rocky to defend me. But at the same time- I want to hire somebody <laughs> else for that kind of thing. But, <laughs> but realistically- I'll give you a college try. I want to hear that from your lawyer. Because <laughs> I've dealt with that realm of, of work where people from the courts who get a DWI come, uh, are sent mm -hmm. to my, my other, my other type of work, which is working with people referred by the court and doing treatment. And some people, hey, I just got, I just got caught. I just got caught. You know, I had done it 50,000 times before. The mentality yeah. on a yeah. person who does not realize that the, the danger yeah, is scary. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of the people out here with mm -hmm. addiction to anything else. So mm -hmm. anyway, with that being said, I, I think it comes off where prevention starts off in little bits and pieces, but it's all throughout life. Mm -hmm. And only one place that tailors to these small communities, I mean, these communities, mm -hmm. it's not enough. There needs to be a lot mm -hmm. more work done. No, I, I think that, that your project and, and the program that, that you're running with Alianza, I think that it's on the right track, you know, because, again, 
just rounding up the children and saying don't do drugs or you know just say no i think that when you look at it from you pull the lens back and you look at it from sort of a like an ecological family socio family um you know just sort of how it's real it's like I think that those children, if you they, if you kind of get the parents to speak to them, and that there's uh you know it's it's and it's kind of maybe it becomes you know comes off as more authentic than just some you know person with a badge just saying you know you better not uh, smoke that we join or I'm going to come get you you know or something like that. I mean, uh, you know I think that that uh, that's a that's a great approach and. You know, I think uh, this is that time where, you know, I'm going to because we're getting close to the end here. But this is my time that for those of you out there, um, you know, who are listening about care about preventive services and such, um, you know, um, CPS is a 501c3. It is a, uh, you know, it's a public charity. And so donations are um, tax deductible um, and you can find them online if you care. If you want to know if you want to help support the work that Ricardo is doing with Alianza, especially, which is much more sort of, and I wouldn't say just culturally sensitive, it's just more like culturally realist and, and culturally sound, you know, it's not just about being sensitive. I think it's it's about being um, supported by our research and also that it works. And if you care about maybe seeing the numbers, I mean, obviously the numbers are going up, but I think that in the margins, in these areas where, you know, we can get more, I mean, because it, 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 it doesn't take very long for someone to get addicted, but it takes a long time to not be addicted, right? It's a lifelong process and, and just to start it. And so um, if you do care about, you know, this type of work and, and, and this mission, um, you can go to www.preventionservices.org. Um, and I think there is a donate now button. I think there's a place where you can even say, I want this all to go to Alianza, uh, you know, as well, if you want it to just mm -hmm. go to support. Um, or you could say it's help everything. Because again, we didn't go deep into what CPS does, because I think that would be a whole other conversation. But, you know, I think that uh, we did want to kind of talk about sort of the, the culturally specific um, content there, because, again, I think there is no one size fits all approach to prevention abuse. Right. I think you've got to know your audience. You got to know um, the, the you know, it's just you got to know the community, you got to know what, all of those things and 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 such. And so um, right now we've reached uh, about 10 minutes, um, at, you know, before the end of the hour. And so. That's the time where we like to open up the floor to have to join, and you can tell we're having fun here, folks. You're <laughs> kind of, we're not. Uh, it's not just very dour, you know. I don't know, like nightline discussion going on here. Uh, and so, mm -hmm. um, why don't you, if, if, if you want, you can go ahead and unmute yourself, hop in, have got a comment or anything or question for either of us. Particularly, you've got Ricardo here to learn more about Alianza and its work with uh, prevention services, or just anything about CPS in general. Um, he's here to, to chat about or if you've got just some thoughts about, you know, just what you're seeing in your community as well. Um, so it'd be a great time to, this is the time where we all sing together. So, I mean, not really, but I don't know, maybe we should, but no, just uh, uh, hop on in. The water's fine. I don't bite. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not promising anything. I'm just kidding. No, I'm just <laughs> My cat does, but not me. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I know you got a question, Shannon. Why don't you ask something then get the ball rolling? Uh, well, I will. I'll ask something. So um, this is random. Um, so, Ricardo, I know like you're working with schools. Are they, do the schools refer you students? How do you partner with CMS folks? Good question. Um, well, we can, we work with them in many different areas. Number one, we rely on them. We rely heavily on them to helping us administer the youth drug survey, which is a huge undertaking. We, uh, this survey is anonymous. That's done in the grade levels of, um, let's see, oh yeah, sixth, eighth, 10th, and 12th grades throughout CMS. And that's a thousands and thousands of students who voluntarily give us information on that survey. So they provide us with uh, people who can help proctor the, the survey. We have, um, someone who's, who evaluates the process uh, all the way through and gives us the results that we need to hear to see that we can then approach, you know, the different grants that we're, we have and um, also we can apply for. But CMS also um, does refer people to our, our information, our, our 
um, our series of trainings, our evidence-based programs. And at the same time, we work closely with, um, in one more area, I just completely lo lost track of my uh, thought, is uh, some of their counselors uh, are trained in Familia Delante, that program that we were sent to New Mexico to, to be trained in specifically, two of their counselors and the rest of us volunteer from, from our Alianza coalition to be trained in this. So there's a great collaboration. They, they also have some of their staff from CMS attend our coalition meetings. And they are very knowledgeable and ask questions about concerns that they have and whatever information that we bring, they bring into the school. So it, it's a win-win to have that kind of connection with CMS um, and providing that data. And like I said, since it's anonymous, that information is helpful to seeing what other things CMS could do to combat that, those issues of drug use. Um, because like I said, it, it gives, it measures many different things. It measures 30 day use. It measures the frequency. It tells people how, how uh, open they were to try opioids or other, other substances. And it, it addresses the different, you know, not just Latino, every ethnicity there is um in country of origin like for example since there's a lot of spanish-speaking countries they also break it down by what they identify as mm -hmm. so it's it's huge it's huge i hope that answers your question so cms and us are we're like this and we work really close together yeah i would say that that's some really good information for those of you who are you know trying to involve with advocacy or really just kind of want to dig in um, I know on this CPS website, preventionservices.org, um, there is an area where you can go to, under our services, you can get the, the youth drug survey. And I know mean, he's mentioned it a few times, mm -hmm. but you can see the, the numbers. And I think there's information for not just Mecklenburg, it looks like mm -hmm. Stanley County, and then where I'm from, uh, Rowan Salisbury yep. um, as well. And so, um, you know, I, I think what is impressive about the work here is it's very data driven very research and evidence thing. Again, I mean, I think in your own head, you know, and again, maybe when they designed it, you know, the, the original, like the dare and stuff, it said, let's just scare these kids. I mean, that's that's what would work with me, right? But then it seems that a lot of the, 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 the research is showing that coming, going to parents in a culturally competent, respectful manner, developing trust, going for the long haul, because obviously you got to develop a relationship. So it's not, you may not see the see the see the effects until maybe many years later because you know it's going to take time for this type of approach to kind of you know to kind of set in you know and so um, you know I think that's um, I think that's very you know I think I think we're seeing like you said we're seeing these approaches to um, abuse prevention and addiction prevention um, evolve over time but you know obviously gone are the days of just scaring the kids you know, and then just telling them don't do it and then and just trying to scare them straight or scare them and just, and now it's really trying to put it in a more culturally competent and, and sort of culturally sound in a real way to, mm -hmm. um, that, that will yield some results, you know, and, and um, I think that uh, we're seeing our, our survey here and, uh, you know, uh, again, it's, you know, we've got, you know, talking about stressors, we had COVID and nothing, there's not been a bigger stressor than COVID it, it really in my lifetime except for maybe maybe that's five or six months of 9 11 you know but then that kind of like tapered off i mean COVID just is sticking around like it's just you know over you for like ever um you know um so um yeah well any other questions or comments i mean i know that we you know you've got opportunity just to kind of just jump in um i know we see some folks here but they're also got muted and uh and uh videos. Well, they don't say oh, something i well, want to say something oh no there's william yeah. Hi, I was going to ask, uh, one, how you guys are funded, and two, how um, the general public uh, and uh, the business community can get involved with you guys. Good question. Thank you so much. Um, we, a lot of the, I want to say the majority of our funds come from grant funds that we apply for. State and federal, they're, they're not really huge amounts of money, but like I said, when you have to apply for several grants to sustain your staff and the projects that you have to comply with what you said you were gonna do and the grants that you applied for is what a majority of our staff are funded by. Uh, being a nonprofit, we have to go by in-kind hours and so forth. 
Um, the business community would be beneficial in helping in there uh, as well with sponsorships where in, in like, for example, I honestly don't know how all that works. I'm still learning right now, but I believe that like with example, with Alianza, we have people in the business community who want their name to go out there that they're doing things in the community. So them participating is one thing, but if they're willing to, to put some money behind it, I mean, I honestly don't like asking for money, but as a nonprofit, anything that goes into the wellness of, for example, a lot of grants cover, hey, we, have, we could do these things, but they don't cover snacks for the kids. That's always an issue with a lot of our programs. We can't provide a bottle of water or a bag of chips to give a, give a kid or a parent or facilitator an idea of, or maybe even providing a meal if they come out of work, you know, for a family program. That's something that a lot of people don't fear. So why we have to spend funds to, to pay for that? But at the end of the day, incentives and things of that nature are important, but we grants don't cover those things. Um, another quick example is there's a Queen City Harm Reduction. That's one of our uh, newest departments where we focus on overdoses, uh, HIV education, um, and those areas are very, in nalox man, 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 naloxone, anything that has to do with overdoses, need, uh, the syringes, syringe exchange programs, things of that nature, we, we provide those so that the numbers go down on overdoses and things of that nature. But we just recently got a facility, a new facility, but we have no furniture. So for example, when we were looking for things for the clients to come in and have a safe environment for the counselors and stuff to work with them, there's a lot of things that we don't have that grants don't cover for furniture. You know, they might cover for a computer, but that might be it, or maybe a printer. So I would say in the donation area on our website, you can also reach out to Angela Allen, um, our director. Uh, she can give you more specifics as to what, to, what uh, areas that you could be a part of. But I do believe a lot of what we have been doing and what we're do that we're going to do is big and we need the support of the community. And the businesses are very important because, like I said, we all need to not avoid the problem because you don't might you might not see it directly, but in every area that's possible, it's important to, to put, you know, get all the help we can get. Thanks, appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Any other questions or comments? Ricardo, I, I will leave the uh, floor to you to finish out our show today. So <laughs> let us, you know, speak to us. All right. Well, listen, I appreciate you all taking the time to, to listen to me rant about prevention and working with the Latino community, but also CPS. Um, I, I tend to believe that there's reason things happen. I honestly got into this field because I care about helping people. And it's easy to say it's, it's interesting to make money, but at the same time, it's at the same time it's better to give and to be a part of something that makes change happen for the better there's a lot of people suffering out there from addiction my father's an alcoholic Did, am i going to call him my father the alcoholic no i'm going to call him my my father who happened to inherit something that for the grace of god didn't die from it but he got help and he's been clean about six or eight years but it took him a lifetime almost to get there. So anyway, I believe that's why I'm in this field because I believe that if it if it could be, sometimes addiction is something that's given to you that you don't even realize through genetics, but also it's a, patterns of behavior that no one took the time to educate you on. And that's why I believe prevention and I believe in treatment as well. But that's why we do what we do. We need to make sure we make an impact and we're looking for people to help us out, to make it be a part of us, not just, hand out, but be a part of the mission. So that's all I'm going to rant about. If there's any other questions, you can reach me uh, at this phone number, 704-375-3784. Uh, extension 4660-375-3784-4660. Or you can send me an email at torres at preventionservices.org. I could put it on the thing down there, on the chat if you need it. So feel free to reach out to me. And if you want more information, like I said, our website is going to be updated and brand new. Um, thank goodness for the funds that we have to show people all the different things that we're doing that's 
you know, more up to date. And thank y'all both for your time. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye. All right, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us on the Holland Channel Leadership Series. Thank you, everybody.